right, good morning everybody again. Welcome to Jew Point. I'm glad you've come to join me this morning. Um, is it for the rugby or for the training that you've come this morning? Okay, there doesn't seem to be any quorum with regards to the decision, but I'm glad you are here. Um, so this morning we're going to be doing a brand new development seminar. This is a development seminar we've never done. Um, it is something that I've been meaning to address for quite a while because it actually goes to the root of Dewpoint as a business and as behavior, as attitude for every wealth engineer. And so I hope um, that this development seminar will be enlightening and challenging at the same time because uh, most certainly in the next hour I'm hoping to be I'm hoping to challenge you um, and so the development seminar is called the serving mindset um, and it is very much centered around changing your mindset from there's always one <laughs> listening listening to us online they're just trying to get the XP I think um, <laughs> the XP um, and so what the Serving mindset is really about is about changing your mindset from a selling mindset, which most of us do, even though we talk about not selling, right? But when we talk about not selling, we're talking about our products, right? But when we go out and we speak to people about the opportunity of Dewpoint, we are very much trying to sell the opportunity to individuals, aren't we? Um, and so what this development seminar is about is about changing that mindset from a selling mindset into a serving mindset. And so you might be wondering, well, what is that? If we're not going out and selling the opportunity, uh, what are we actually doing? Um, and so as we go through the development seminar, like I said, I'm most certainly going to be challenging your mindset because we, this, this need to convince people that Dewpoint, that becoming a wealth engineer, that joining your channel is the thing to do, is ingrained in all of us, right? We do it throughout life, in business, in relationships, we try to prove our worth constantly because that is an uh, ingrained desire to feel worthy to others. Um, and so in the next hour and beyond, I need you to open up your minds to change, right? You have to, you have to embrace change uh, for this to sink in. And so throughout the development seminar and like I said, beyond, this is something you're going to have to meditate on. This is something you're going to have to think about because it's not something that's going to suddenly change after the next hour. Um, you might have to pray about it. Think about it in the mornings. Uh, think about it before you speak to anybody, right? Um, and then hopefully with time, this is something that takes hold within your spirit almost because like I said, this is something that is deeply ingrained in us. Um, and this will become a more apparent when we go through. So I'm going to be discussing three principles um, in the development seminar. The first one is to stop selling and to start serving. The first thing we have to be aware of when we enter in any discussion with anyone, whenever we go speak to a prospect, is that we always go in with an agenda. Right? You've got a goal when you go speak to a prospect. Right? What is that goal typically? That goal is, I want them to sign up. Ultimately, that's your goal, right? That is your agenda. And this is where the problem starts. Because your agenda, well, let's start off there with the top line. No one likes to be sold to. Right? Have you ever, you, you've experienced it yourself. When someone comes up to you and you're like, oh, I mean, I feel it all the time. If I go into the shops and the shop person comes along, can I help you? I'm like, I'm just looking. Yes. Right? We all say that. I'm just looking. Because we don't want to be sold to. No one likes to be sold to. Because what's happening in that moment, in that transfer of energy, is you know the person is trying to come to you with their agenda at heart. They're not actually coming to try to help you. right? They don't have your interest at heart. And so no one likes to be sold to. Having your agenda at the top of that priority list means that your needs and outcomes are the priority in that transaction, in that discussion, right, in that connection with the prospect. Your conversation becomes very one-sided. How many of you have got scripts when you go speak to people? You already know what to say. This is what I say. This is what I say. This is what I'm going to tell them. This is how I deal with objections, right? Because that's part of your agenda. This is your way of overcoming the objections, the other person, conquering that other person, turning them into a conquest. 
Um, and most certainly it exemplifies what your agenda is all about by having the script. It means that every interaction that you have with every prospect is going to be the same. Again, your needs get placed above that person's. And it leaves no room for the other person. Because you have not gone into that transaction, that discussion, that connection with the other person, with that person's needs in mind. It's always about your agenda. You cannot learn or grow if you go into every transaction with every prospect the same way. And your agenda is the same every single time. And so if you go in with your agenda, it means you are going to enter into every conversation with the prospect the same. There is no room for learning and growing if you place your agenda above the other person's needs. And so the first thing that we need to do is if we're going to adopt the serving mindset is we need to get rid of our agenda. Right? And so how do we do that? Firstly, we don't force the direction of the conversation. We don't go in with this preconceived outcome, which is very difficult, right? Well, what am I doing there? I'm, I'm trying to build a channel. I'm trying to get pers this person to join Dewpoint. Now you're telling me, no, don't do that. That's exactly what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, go into the conversation without any direction, with no expectation of the outcome. Don't expect to understand their reality either. Right? When you go in open-minded, when you go in with curiosity about, well, how do I actually help or serve this person? And they start telling you about what their reality is. Right? And we address those questions objections all the time. People will say to us, oh, those businesses don't work. Oh, people only lose money in those things. Oh, that's a pyramid scheme. Whatever the objection is, how often do we dismiss the objection and go, oh, those people don't know what they're talking about. I do it all the time. Not only in business, in life. If someone else's reality doesn't fit mine, like if someone says something or they behave in a certain way, that doesn't fit with my value system or the way I believe or operate, I will dismiss that person. So in other words, I will look at them in a dismissive way. I do it to my wife. Right? I do. If my wife doesn't believe the way I believe, if she does something or believes of do, uh, doing something in a certain in a particular way that doesn't agree with me, I'll often say, to her, oh, she does it because she's doing this, or she's doing it because of that. I become dismissive of the way she believes. I become dismissive of her reality. That creates a very big problem, right? It comes from a place of narcissism and ego, by the way. Well, at least this is what my marriage counselor tells me. <laughs> and so we've got to be aware that with every prospect that we meet, every one of them are going to be different. Different to each other and very likely different to us. And so do we become dismissive when they don't agree to what our agenda is? Or do we just listen with empathy? Right? You must ask more questions. If you ask questions, you set your agenda aside, right? But we don't ask too many questions. We come in with the assumption that everybody needs dew point. Don't we? Yes, we do. Everybody needs dew point. That might be the truth, but that leaves no place for that person. If we come in with that agenda that you must just take it because you need it, that is very dismissive. It's very egotistical to come to a person and say, you need this before I even understand what that person's challenges are. And so we need to listen and learn. Listen to learn about the person instead of listening to respond. How often do we want to listen and respond? Ah, oh, I know the answer to that, ob that objection. Right? And so the starting point to the serving mindset is to get rid of this agenda. This agenda that we all come in with. And I promise you, it'll make the transaction, it'll make connection with prospects a lot more natural and a lot easier. Because deep in your heart, you're actually made to help other people. Believe it or not. Right? This becomes very apparent. We had, uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times when Marsha and Ruloff joined us with one of their new wealth engineers, uh, Philip Fareed down in Neisner. And he had already been doing uh, Dewpoint for a while, um, 
most certainly with his agenda at the pro top of the priority list. And he was extremely busy. He's speaking to about 100 new people a day. Um, and when he came up to Joburg to sit down in an interview, he shared with us this revelation that he had. That when he had this opportunity to help another person, to really help them, not by placing his agenda before what they required, but really just by talking to them, empowering them, and sharing his testimony with them. And when that person came back to him later in the day saying, you changed my entire day for me. You changed my entire outlook. I'm no longer in this dark hole. You've brought me out this dark hole, and I feel empowered, and I feel like there's hope, and I can do this. And that person's entire world changed in a day. And Philip shared, he said, I realize what my purpose is in this business. His agenda had disappeared completely after he realized where the, uh, when he came to that revelation. He said, even at the end of five years, if I'm still not wealthy in this business, I'll be happy if I've helped just five people. Do you see? He came to that realization on his, on his own. And this is what we're trying to do with the serving mindset. And so it is reflected in your app, by the way, in your prospect manager, because when you record any new prospect in your app in the prospect manager, there are fields, right? You can be lazy and go into the prospect manager and just add name and email, name and cell phone, right? And that's it and save. But if you don't get to this page, the page that asks you notes, additional notes, and most importantly, specific needs, well, then you're most certainly not trying to serve that person that you've connected to. And so this becomes a great litmus test. This is a great um, qualifying question that you can ask yourself after you've spoken to any prospect. Am I able to fill out these two fields when I record a prospect? If you cannot fill that out, specific needs of that particular prospect, well then you haven't served that person, right? And so we're still early in the development seminar. You might be thinking, well, what's the point? What's What's the advantage of serving every single person that I speak to? Okay, we'll ask the question again towards the end of the presentation. And so at the heart of serving is to have deep caring for the people that we get to touch, right? And have a deep curiosity of those people's lives and what their challenges are. And to be able to set aside our personal agendas in that process. And so there are three things that we're going to go through. Stop selling and start serving. We need to aspire to creating partnership instead of conquesting people, right? Getting through all these people. We sometimes, I mean, we say it often in the business, you know, they're just numbers. Get through them. Just say next. Just say next. Yes, that's true. But your attitude and your behavior has to be one that aspires to creating partnership with the individuals that come into your business. Not just treating them as numbers. You're there to collaborate with people. Your success is dependent on successful collaboration. Not competition, which is a great benefit in this business, right? Because it's very much the antithesis of employment. Employment is very much competitive. You're competing constantly in this very competitive work environment that we all face ourselves in because you don't know who's going to be retrenched next. And then you're there to build community, not conquests. Right? That's the wonderful thing. We're all going to sit down and watch the rugby after this. You do that with people that you like, with people that you've built community with, not people you're in competition with. Well, you might be forced to sit down with people you're in competition with, but it won't be enjoyable, will it? And then again, a qualifying question that you can ask yourself in this process is, does your prospect feel that you care about them? Because at the end of the day, the only person whose opinion matters is your prospects. Right? The next one is, stop justifying and start serving. We justify because we're trying to prove the worth of Dewpoint, of becoming a wealth engineer, of joining our channel. Right? That's what we think we're there to prove. We're there to convince people that, yes, Dewpoint is worth it. I'm worth it. Come join me. I will help you. Again, that comes from a place of ego, right? Because we so dearly want to be valued. At the same time, you're constantly trying to justify what you have to offer. Why don't they see it? How often do we say that? They just don't see it. I don't understand why they don't see it. 
instead of justifying, right, instead of placing that pressure on yourself of trying to justify the value of this business and what you're able to offer the person, just start serving. Just become really curious and at the same time respectful of your prospect's challenges. It changes your discussion completely with that person. Do you see how polar opposite the two are? Here I'm trying to convince someone. Here I'm just talking to them and trying to find out more about them. You might be worried and thinking, well, is this going to lead to anything? <laughs> right? Because the point of being curious is to find out really what their challenge is. Right? If you're able to find out what the real challenge is, then only, then only you can offer the solution. We've touched on this many times in a lot of the devs before. Find out what that need is and address the need instead of just coming with this predefined script of what Dewpoint is about and what the benefits are about and how do you not see this, right? Stop pleasing and start serving. You might think, well, pleasing is just about being nice. To a degree it is, right? You agree with everything. You don't want to offend your prospect. You want to tell them what they want to hear, right? Because you're so desperate to get them to sign up. You tiptoe around sensitive topics because you don't want to discuss them. It's easier. There's more of a comfort zone for you to discuss things that are easy to discuss. <coughs> to be really authentic, to tell people information, to give them information that benefits them that they might not want to hear is a lot more difficult because it is uncomfortable. The problem with stop, uh, trying to please people and trying to tell them what they want to hear is that it often will end up compromising your values. Why? Because it goes beyond just being nice. It will lead you to a path where you start telling them untruths about the business. Right? And so here are a couple of examples that we've all experienced. Dewpoint is going to cost you nothing. Oh, you're unemployed. You don't have any money. No, don't worry. Dewpoint doesn't cost you a cent. You can get rich really quickly with Dewpoint. Some people are saying that, uh, don't you get really rich with Dewpoint? <laughs> you earn one rand for one XP that you earn. Do you know how often we get calls in client service where we've got wealth engineers who want to exchange, they want to draw their XP out of their bank accounts here at Dewpoint. And then everything is half price in the Wealth Points program. Do you know we had this in endemic issue in KZN where a couple of wealth engineers started telling people that it was half price at Checkers, half price at Nando's. They had queues outside their doors of people wanting to sign up to Dewpoint. Right? This we experienced in 2017 and we had to deal with it. Why? Because those people were so desperate that they had gone way beyond compromising their values and they were willing to tell people anything to get them to sign up. And so what is the more difficult truth to tell people instead of things like that? So for example, no, Dewpoint is not completely for free. The cheapest product is going to cost you at least 249 Rand a month, right? You will have to spend money on data. You might even have to spend money on travel. And that's why we always say the business is not for people who are unemployed that have absolutely no money. This Business is here to empower people that at least have the resources to do Dewpoint. That is the truth that we tell people. You can become wealthy this lifetime. That's what you tell people. Ooh, that's a long time. I want to be rich next week. <laughs> right? Why are Get Rich Quick Scheme so prolific? Why on Power FM last week Friday did the lady come on and say, I don't care if it's an illegal pyramid scheme, I can make money quickly and I can fleece other people and it's not a problem. She admitted that. You've got to get in and out quickly, that's what she said. We are not one of those businesses. I want to be as far separated from those businesses as possible. Right? It happens by being honest with people. Yes, you can do the Achiever Quest and you can make money, short-term money quickly, but it only lasts you a month. 
True wealth at Dewpoint is built through the returns program. And the returns program is built on being able to build a sustainable channel over time. Not in the short term. XP has absolutely no monetary value. Tell people the truth. The discounts vary in the Wealth Points program. Right? There's some partners where there's no discount. There's other partners that offer you 2%, 2.5%, 5%, up to 30%. Be honest with people. You can only do that if you replace your agenda with the ambition to help and serve those people, to give them information that will benefit them, not yourself. Right? Stop pleasing, start serving. This week was an amazing week on Netflix for me. There were two absolutely wonderful documentaries that came up on Netflix this week about these two gentlemen here. That is the president of the Grammys of the American Recording Association. Uh, but the two gentlemen standing next to him, uh, both born in the 30s in the US, Clarence A. Vant and Clive Davis. Let's start with Clive Davis. Sure, Clive Davis is worth nearly a billion dollars. He started out as a lawyer. Uh, both his parents died at the age of 18, 19. Um, but he put himself through law school. He became a lawyer. He then got involved as a lawyer in the music business. And then in the music business, he started representing artists. Right? And so he's had an illustrious career where they've tried to kick, where other executives have tried to kick him out of his own business. He then took over all the businesses and he's just, he's just had this massive success. And he's represented, the beautiful thing is that he's represented so many different genres of music and so many different types of artists. Everything from R&B, hip hop, rock, heavy metal. Um, but when you look at the documentary and you hear from all these artists that is represented, you know, people that were very much unsuccessful until he decided to sign them up. So he had Barry Manilow, he had um, Whitney Houston, he had Aerosmith, uh, Billy Joel, the list is endless of the artists that, re that he represented. But when you listen from the artist's mouths, when they speak of Clive Davis, they all say how he just helped them. His ambition was not to make money. He's become very rich in the process. But his agenda his agenda was not his own. It was to help other people. And that becomes so apparent in this documentary Netflix. So go watch that. And then Clarence Avent, uh, born in the 30s, in the South, very poor. So in the South, they were still under Jim Crow law, which is very much like apartheid. Um, and you think this black man born in America in the 1930s, what prospect could he have? Especially in business. Yet he's made a massive success out of himself. Right? He's represented everything from the music industry to the political sphere, social, current, um, cultural sphere. He's been this ambassador of black people in America, right? where he's represented all these artists and he's had all the success. And you see how fondly the artists speak of him when he was willing to give them a chance and help them become these rising stars. Right, and also endless list of artists that we represented. And there's a lovely line in the documentary where his wife says, that's all he's done. That's all he's ever done. Anyway, you know, it's just help those people who needed help. That's all he's done. Not with the ambition to make money. I know that becomes difficult in this context because Dewpoint is about creating wealth. But now I'm telling you, don't have this agenda of creating wealth. Replace it with the serving mindset. And I'm hoping throughout this dev seminar, you start getting closer to the realization of, I can, get, I, I can get what I want if I help other people. And so the result of serving, what is the result of now replacing justification and selling and pleasing everybody with this mindset of serving, just going into conversations and just finding out about someone, deeply caring about the stranger that I'm now speaking to and trying to find out really what their need is so I can offer them a solution. You get to change the perception that that person has of you. And that changes the response that you will get from those individuals. 
Because typically the response of anyone that comes to me trying to get something out of me for their benefit, I don't want to know those people. I realize that their agenda is ahead of mine. Why are you talking to me? Are you so desperate to get the 55 rand out of me? That's the impression I'm left with. But if I realize, right, if my impression of you is, wow, this person actually wants to help me, it changes everything, right? And you are seen to be more valuable to that prospect. They will answer your WhatsApps. They will come to the intro presentation. Why? Because they realize you're there to help them, that you are valuable to them. And it ultimately leads to a deeper connection with that person. And if you can create a deeper connection to the person that you're ultimately bringing into your channel, it lays a foundation of trust. And if it lays a foundation of trust, well, that person might hang around longer. They might build a channel with you with more confidence. And even if they don't sign up, it opens you up to unexpected opportunities in the future. Why? Because that person is not closed off to you. They value you and they trust you. And maybe in two months, maybe in a year, maybe in three years, they come back to you and they say to you, remember that business you told me about? I think I'm ready to look at it and join. Because the antithesis is you with your agenda up here trying to block every single objection that they have, right? And then walking away disgusted that why don't they see it? And then what happens the day afterwards? That person at due point, ah, I'm never finding them again. Block them on WhatsApp, right? That's the impression you create. And so together, we have to adopt the serving mindset so that people in South Africa look at Dewpoint and go, that is a business built to help people, not to fleece them. Do you know why that's so important for the culture of our business? That we all adopt this new mindset. The second principle is this, very much this polar mindset between scarcity and abundance. Now this is quite an interesting one because it's almost a paradox when you have to try and address it. Um, and so there's a lovely lady uh, who's actually got a talk, I don't know if she's got a book, but uh, she's definitely got a talk, a lecture on uh, what she calls parental consciousness. So it's a parenting, a parenting guide. Um, but she's got a wonderful quote that really embodies the serving mindset. Um, and this principle of scarcity versus abundance. She says you cannot pursue abundance from lack. What she's saying is you cannot pursue abundance from a scarcity mindset. Now this is interesting, right? Because you might feel that your circumstance says to you, it is one of scarcity. I'm trying to get rich, right? So I'm trying to pursue abundance. But here the lady is saying, no, no, you can't pursue abundance if you have a scarcity mindset. Pursuing abundance is a trap. You'll miss out on the joy of the process. Happiness is misunderstood. Happiness is the fullness of being engaged in the process uh, or in the present moment. Okay, now I'm going to show it to you. A scarcity mindset is one of desperation. I don't have, I desperately need. My agenda is at the top. I need to build a channel. I need to get qualified. I need to get qualified wealth engineers. You are desperately trying to get people into your business. Why? Because you're trying to address the scarcity that you have. You are chasing abundance. It shows a lack of self-worth. If you are desperate, right? If people can see the desperation in you, where you compromise the way you talk to people, you get impatient, you get angry with people, that type of thing. That desperation shows them that you and Dewpoint aren't worth a lot. Because that approach lacks confidence, right? And at the same time, if you have the scarcity mindset, you at the same time will fear being arrogant slash confident in what you have to offer. 
that conveys low quality. This is a mindset, right? We are not talking about your circumstance. We are talking about your attitude and your behavior when you speak to other people. And so the opposite of that is having an abundance mindset. Because if you have an abundance mindset, you believe that there are endless wonderful opportunities all around you. Like Patrick says, there are 55 rands walking everywhere around me. <laughs> you don't have this fear that this one person you're speaking to is the one and only wealth engineer that is going to make or break you. Right? And so this abundance mindset makes for confidence, not desperation. And when you approach people with confidence, they go, wow, this person must really believe and trust what they're doing. They have confidence in what they're doing. And so your value goes up in what you're offering. Your worth, and this is a very important one, right? Because this speaks to your own heart. Your worth does not fluctuate with your results or your circumstance. <coughs> How many of us judge ourselves because of the circumstance that we're in today? Right? The system does that to you. It does. The way people treat you, the way people see you, the car you have, the house that you've got, the job that you have, the salary that you earn. It places you in this pigeonhole where you are labeled. You have to throw off that belief. When you go speak to people about this opportunity, right? if you come in without your agenda, if you come into discussion with the only ambition to help somebody, right? without putting any pressure on yourself that this is the one and only person that you have to get into your business that is going to make or break you. When you go in just going, let me see if I can help this person. Let me see if I can discover more about this person and what their true challenge is, what their true challenge is and whether I can provide a solution to them. Whether I can provide a solution. Not, and then I will give them due point. And so do you see the antithesis of the mindset? Scarcity versus abundance. It's a mindset. I'm going to say it to you again. It is an attitude. It is not your circumstance. You could have nothing, right? You could feel, for lack of a better word, poor. But that doesn't force you to go in with a scarcity mindset. It doesn't force you to become desperate in the outcome of trying to get a person to sign up as a wealth engineer. And so we've got to question how we think. Right? Principle number three is welcoming and addressing objections. Who loves getting objections? Yalla <laughs> lich. When that person says to you, ah, it's a pyramid scheme. Do you love getting that objection? No. I don't believe it. And so we need to get into a position where we do. We welcome objections. Because if you have that person's challenge at heart, if you have their, uh, their need at heart, if that becomes your agenda, if that becomes your priority to help that person, well then you have to figure out what their objections are. Their objections are evidence and clues into what they fear, what their problem is, what their challenges is. So objections are a standard response. You are going to get objections, right? Someone who says, oh, I looked at the intro, I'm going to join. Without a single objection, I get worried about those people, right? I want people to ask questions and inquire because those are the people that are going to stay in the business for longer. The people that come in without a single question, you know they've got some other priority in mind in the business, right? Only sellers can be rejected. So often we don't like objections because we fear the rejection that it might lead to. But because you're not selling anything anymore, there can be no rejection. And so that should take the pressure off you. Aim to explore, not to overcome. To explore, ask, 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 find out more. Because often the first objection that you get is not the real objection. <coughs> Discover the real objection, right? You only do that by asking multiple questions. And something happens in that transaction, in that discussion. When you start asking more questions, that other person becomes more aware that you might have their interests at heart instead of your own. And they become more vulnerable in the process and they become more willing to share. Honestly, 
with you, right? Exploring allows you to serve better because of that. You can only serve once you know what the real objection is. It's going to feel uncomfortable. Because typically, initially, when you speak to somebody, they give you the objection hoping you will go away. And so you've got to push through that discomfort, right? And you can say to the person, because you'll get that, you get that line, let me think about it. Which is a iron wall coming down between you and the other person. I want to get away from you. Let me think about it. And do they contact you later yeah. and say, I thought about it. Never. <laughs> right? And so you cannot let that opportunity escape you. When someone says to you, let me think about it. Let me go talk to my wife. Let me go talk to my husband. Let me get back to you at the end of the week. That needs addressing immediately. Before that person walks away. You kindly say, do you mind if I ask you just a couple more questions? Because I don't want to let the opportunity escape me where I can find out a little bit more about what challenges you have. Or perhaps how I can help you address it there and then. right? Because it might give you the opportunity of finding out what the real objection is that that person has. Because they haven't told you yet. Let me think about it is them saying, I don't want to talk to you. It's not about them being vulnerable and saying, you know what I really want out of this life or what is really hurting me at the moment or what I really fear. You haven't got there yet. Right. And so it becomes your challenge. Your challenge becomes to, become, to get deeper with that person, to find out more about what that person or what's going on for that person. And so a typical objection that we might get is something like this. These things never work. Doesn't that trigger you? It triggers me, man. These things never... What are you talking about? These things? You're calling my business these things? I'm not these things. But if we just want to overcome the person, if we just want to deal with the objection because we're trying to get them to see how valuable Dewpoint is, then we might say to them, yes, they do. Look at all the people making money. Are you stupid? <laughs> That's what you're thinking, Right? You cannot understand how their reality is not your reality. How do they not see it? This is the mistake we make. This is not serving. This is our ego trying to show its own value. Instead, instead, we explore with empathy. Not sympathy. Sympathy is patronizing. Empathy is when you task yourself with trying to feel what that person is actually feeling. Not feeling sorry for the way they feel. That is sympathy. Empathy is when you get into the hole with them. Right? And so our reaction might be, I know, right? Because empathy is about relating to the person. Because you were there once too, remember? You were all non-wealth engineers once upon a time. And so how do we relate to them? Right? So here's a couple of examples. I know, right? There's so many things out there. You're not crazy to think that these things never work because we see it happening all around us. Have you tried something like this before? Start exploring. What's stopping you from trying this business? Are you concerned about the risk? Are you concerned about the cost? Try get to the real objection. These things never work is not the real objection. All right. Helping overcome the real objection. I cannot afford to lose money. Dew point is very low risk. And I can help you earn in your first month. That's you addressing the real objection. The real objection has become, I can't afford to lose money. Right? The initial response was, those things never work. But truly their fear is, it's like, I have no space to lose money. Right? If I enter into this thing and you're telling me, well, it's going to cost you $249 and there's going to be some data costs and maybe travel costs. Right? If I start this thing and it fails, my husband is going to kill me. Right? That is the true fear, for example. And so when you find out what the real objection is, you can then address it authentically. You can say, yes, it is 249. It's very low risk if you think about what you can gain out of this business. Right? You are so under pressure that you have this fear of not wanting to lose something. 
If you can make it happen, if you can make the 249 happen, if you can watch the intro videos and the dev seminars and find out how to get onto Wi-Fi or afford the data, I can help you earn in your first month if you're willing to do the work, right? And so that's how we address the objection by offering the solution. I don't trust any of these businesses. That is often one of the big ones. The person really just doesn't trust you or the business, right? Because they don't know anything about you or the business. You can only address that if you spend the time in showing them that you actually care for that person. And so you can say, and that's an easy one. The trust thing is such an easy one to address because Dewpoint does so much to mitigate any fear that people have of this business, right? We are registered with the DSA. We're regulated by the, the regulator. We are listed as a public company. We've got all these things. We've got track record. We've got testimony. And at the same time, we've low risk. And so that's an easy one to address. And so handling the real objection successfully with the person, when they go, okay, right, okay, right, you start building trust with that individual. And that transaction becomes a lot easier and more authentic. And it will feel better to you at the end of the day, right? Because you've tasked yourself ultimately in this business by connecting people into a business. So now you have responsibility of those people, right? And trust builds growth and persistence. Our biggest thing that we try to achieve in this business is persistence to keep people engaged in Dewpoint for longer. That is only built on trust about deep caring and connection with the people that you bring into your channels. So steps to creating space, not overcoming. So a couple of examples of, well, how do we make space for this person to tell me more so I can get to that real objection, right? Listen without talking. I'm terrible at that. I've got my response lined up the moment you open your mouth. And if you take too long, I will interrupt you. <laughs> that is bad. That is bad, right? So listen without talking. Even when they stop talking, it doesn't mean you have to respond. Often, and I've tested this, often if you just keep quiet for a second longer, that person carries on talking again. They open up a little bit more. Listen without responding. Listen without waiting for your turn. When your brain starts loading up the response, shake your head so that the response goes away. And think about a question or think about the person's situation or try to understand how they're feeling. If you can arm your brain instead of with a response but with a question, how is this person feeling? How is this person feeling? How is this person feeling? Right? It might evoke you to ask more authentic questions about getting down to what their actual challenge is. And then how do you relate to them? Help them not to feel estranged when they give you these objections and you look at them with that funny look. We had that the other day on Facebook. What is the face you pull when they say no? <laughs> right? How do you relate to them? I had the same thought you had. I was also there. I also believed that. I also thought that. Agree with them. Come down to their level. Right? Hostage negotiators. That is a technique of hostage negotiators. Get down to the level of the person that you're speaking to. If they're angry, you show that you're also angry. If you're frustrated, you show that you're also frustrated. I know, right? There's so many of those things. That is empathy. That is relating with the person. That allows the person not to feel estranged. In other words, they don't feel judged by you because they have objections to what you're trying to show them. Serving requires courage. It does. It does require courage. We spoke about how uncomfortable it can feel to push through that initial kind of veil that you have when you're trying to get people to relate to you authentically, right? To dig a little bit deeper because they're trying to push you away, right? Their assumption is that you're trying to get something out of them. And you're trying to prove to them that you're not, that you're actually trying to help them, right? And so it takes courage to push through that, to get out of that comfort zone. Because not doing that is just an easy way out for you. To have one script for every single prospect that you go speak to, it's just an easy way to go. It's an easy way to get through numbers. There's the same script, same script, same to other. Oh, said yes, that one said no, that one said yes, that one said no. The nature of serving, of the serving mindset requires courage. It requires vulnerability on the other person's part. And perhaps from you too. 
Because if you're going to relate, I hope you relate to them authentically and honestly, which requires you to be vulnerable. Authenticity and finally, leadership. It requires you to have these leadership qualities. Why? Because leadership requires you not to fall into the pit of justifying and pleasing and saying half untruths about what the business can do for people. It requires a confidence in yourself in the long term game, right? And that's what leadership is all about. The serving mindset. At the end of the day, the only opinion that counts is that of your prospect. So a lot of the source material in this uh, dev seminar was based on this lady's book, Fanush Brock. Um, so if you want to explore this a lot more, right, and she speaks uh, to this whole principle from a business point of view, go get her book, The Serving Mindset, and you can go see some of her interviews online as well. She's done a TED Talk on The Serving Mindset, which is wonderful. Um, and then I came across this individual, Titus O'Neill, foreboding looking man, right? Six foot six. He's currently a WWE professional, uh, a wrestler. But man, has this guy had a tough life. He was born because his mom was raped at the age of 11. She had him at the age of 12. And he became a very, very, very angry individual, especially in his teens. Right? And you read the quote. People gave to me and my family and my mom and other kids in my situation when they had nothing to gain in return. That is what the serving mindset is all about. Putting someone else's care above your own agenda. Right? And the significant change that it marked in this man. He got into college, he became an amazing uh, football player, American football player. One of the best in high school. Uh, it allowed him to get a scholarship in Florida, a football scholarship. So he became uh, this NFL star. Um, and not only on the field, off the field, he graduated in three years. Did his degree in three years in um, higher education. Uh, and then he went on to play NFL football professionally. Uh, then he became a WWE professional, a wrestling professional. And at the same time, he's involved in so many community uh, organizations where he's been given uh, Dad of the Year awards because he's become a really amazing father. Um, and he's involved in all these community outreach programs just to, to pass it on, to help other people. Um, and so he's uh, doing a lot of TED Talks called The Unexpected Power of Love. Then we have uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, he's got a book called The Infinite Game. Uh, so he's really becoming fast uh, one of the hottest speakers on the speaking circuit uh, globally. Um, very much from a business point of view. So The Infinite Game is about uh, where he addresses that business has to be approached as an infinite game. Not a finite game. So he says business is an infinite game and when you play with a finite mindset, right, lots of people suffer including the companies themselves that we're trying to build. You think about your agenda. Your agenda has a finite mindset. The scarcity mindset is a finite mindset because you are chasing abundance. You're chasing a number. Right? You, you're trying to conquest these people. You're trying to get to these numbers every day, my numbers every month. That places a lot of pressure on you. Right? In the process, if your agenda is the priority, people get hurt in the process. Why? Because we treat them just like numbers. And so this becomes a principle that we've adopted at Dewpoint even from the outset. And it is reflected in our mission. Dewpoint is intentional and active in the pursuit of creating hope and dignity and prosperity through social entrepreneurship. That is our mission in this business. You as wealth engineers are not apart from this mission. You are not outside Dewpoint. There isn't Dewpoint and then wealth engineers. We are all in this together. You are Dewpoint. And so I want you to embrace what we've spoken about today. Embrace our mission and challenge yourself because we're all, we all fall foul of placing our agendas at the top of the priority list, right? Goal setting, results, getting it done. And so it's quite a difficult thing. And I'm not being flippant about it when I say to you, 
really try and look at this mindset and go, okay, how do I enter into a discussion with somebody where my agenda is not to get them to become wealth engineers? Does that not evoke a little bit of fear in you? Thinking, can I be successful if I don't go in with that mindset? But I want you to challenge yourself with it. That's why at the beginning I said you need to open your mind to this change. Because it's not something that's automatically going to happen now that we walk out of the office. And so for me, is when you look at the mission, the antithesis of this. If we had to rewrite the mission, if Brendan and my agendas were completely personal in this business, 100% personal, we only wanted the result. And that result was, uh, Dewpoint is intentional in building as big a financial services business in Africa as possible, so that we can buy big houses, maybe even a jet and really fast cars. How would that make you guys feel? How would it feel to go out trying to get people in when you knew that Rob and Brendan are only here just to make as much money out of you as possible? Now reflect on yourselves. Is your goal just to make money, as much money as possible for yourself? It's not something that we look at or reflect on often, right? We do it automatically. We go, well, I'm going to help the person in the process. So what's the harm? No, it affects your attitude and your behavior to that person. We spoke about it in the last hour, right? And so I hope that becomes obvious to you. you go, well, now my approach is very different. Now I'm just going to ask questions. At the end of the day, that litmus test, that question that you can ask yourself after dealing with the prospect is, do I understand their real need? You can do that with every prospect that you speak to. And so we're trying to build a business based around this, a community based around this, where everyone becomes empowered because we are willing to go out and help people to connect them to a business, right? And so I hope in the coming weeks and the months and the coming years, and ultimately one day, whether it's in 20 years time or 30 years time or 40 years time, we can look back and go, we were successful in building a business where everyone on the outside looks at Dewpoint and says, that is a business built to help people. Imagine your children being wealth engineers and they never ever got the objection of, oh, I'm here to show you Dewpoint and the response is, oh, those things never work. When everyone knows, oh, Dewpoint is actually a good business, where we don't get classed as one of those businesses. Wouldn't that be an amazing day when we don't have to deal with that assumption anymore? That's what we want to achieve. And we've got to do it individually. So thank you guys. If you have any questions that you want to come speak to me about. And I want to hear responses. I want to hear you coming and say, ah, that was a load of rubbish that you spoke about today. Yeah. Business is about conquering. Which it was very much, right? If you look at businesses in the 80s and the 90s, that's what business was about. It was about results. And we saw what the results were. The banking sector in America nearly, well, they did. They crumbled until the government decided to bail them out. So I'm sure we can do this together. Thank you.